it's only a kick, a jump, a block, it's only a serve, it's only a tackle, a run, it's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandsLots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Podcast, the place to catch up on all the regional and national rugby in Wales. You can find us on all the usual social media platforms and message us through there if you want, or you can email us on Welsh Regional Rugby Pod at gmail.com. So, all the boring stuff out of the way, let's talk rugby. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of the Rap Podcast with me, Lee G. Joining me as always, full crew this week, Carly, Jamie, and James. Good evening, gentlemen. Evening. Hello. Was that a Benny Hill salute there, James? I just sort of I've been yeah. I've been listening, I've been listening to a lot of history podcasts, so I'm like saluting a lot. <laughs> I think we skip over that one as best as we can then. Um, right, let's head straight. There's a load of stuff to get through this week, boys. So let's let's head into important stuff first. Drink of the week. Uh, so James has promised me that he's got something decent this week instead of pretending to hide behind something in a in a can that we can't see. So what what have you got, James? Well, this week I have got a fruited IPA from a company called Brew York called Juice Forsyth. Oh, I like the look of that. I like the look of that. And in, uh, great name. So I've I've had this before, and it was the result. It's only five percent, but I, I bought a load of these for my Christmas, like Christmas do for the work. Mm. And this was the beginning of my downfall. But on on the back, it it, it says, um, "Good game, good game." Do you want to go higher? <laughs> uh, then enjoy the juicy bonus from this fruited IPA that combines Cascade, Citra, Columbus, and Mosaic hops with <laughs> Muchos pineapple, passion fruit, and mango for a tropical explosion as bold and juicy as the legendary entertainer. The salute. Nice to see you. To see you. It's even got a Hugh Griffin spider graph on the back of the taste. <laughs> Oh, that sounds Ooh. great. I want that. I Excuse want me, I Where can I get a of that from? I got Where this from Morrison's. From? They're, they're right, I'm going to go to Morrison's tomorrow. I'm going to get that beer. So it sounds great. <laughs> and it's bloody lovely as well. Oh, oh jealous now. All right. Ooh, uh, Jamie, you can follow that up then, mate. What, what have you got to follow that? Well, it's nowhere near as, ex- ex- as exciting, unfortunately. I got another fell in foul ale. Dragon's Heart, mm. this one is. Don't know if you've had that one before, Lee. No, it's a no. red ale. So just mm. quickly read the wanky bollocks. This is a full drinking premium Welsh ale, which is malty and gently hot. Dragon's Heart has a rich colour and smooth, balanced character with lots of red fruit flavour and buttery overtones. 4.5% wanky bollocks. But you know what? I think this is the nicest Felinfall ale I've had. I love the colour on it. It's like one of those lovely Welsh red ales, you know? It's um, it's very mm. nice. Very Moorish. So, yeah. So and so That's do the bottom of the barrel, mate. Mm, I, I, I didn't think they actually. No, did it's it. lovely. Okay, look at that. We, we'll have to have a crack at that one then. 
Yeah. Harley, Harley, can you follow it up with anything more wanky bollocksy than those two loads? Uh, of- do you know what? It's actually going to be the exact opposite. So it's almost anti hashtag wanky bollocks. So um, I've gone back to an old favourite. So proper job by St. Orsall's Brewery. So that's mm-hmm. five and a half percent for those who care about those. And the, and, and the blurb on this is an authentic IPA packed full of citrus flavours. Proper job is big, bold, strong beer with a crisp, bitter finish. Perfect for pain with full flavoured dishes. Like that is the right level of wanky bollocks. For you mm. go, oh, that sounds nice. That's a good <laughs> Jesus Christ, you I bet you were an ass in school. Mm. Well, it, you don't have to be pissed to find it attractive. You can go, actually, that just sounds like a normal beer. You don't have to be yeah. kind of you know half pissed already. Okay, I can't let us sound of that. So uh I'm still traipsing through birthday beers. And I've been avoiding this one for some time. It was it was at the back of the fridge. Uh, my daughter found it on Saturday and uh, put it at the front. And then when I was out walking the dogs earlier, she took it out of the fridge and put it on the desk upstairs. So there was no way of getting around it. So this is 8%. It's from the Salt Brewery. It's called uh, iCat. And it's a, a, a tropical IPA. So there's like a whole fucking four paragraphs worth of wanky bollocks on there none of it actually says anything about the beer none of it says it's made with this it's got this it just says we like this and we do this and we're going to follow our own path because we're wanky bollocks amazing um when it comes to crafting beer and pursuing our own evolution we're pushing on at pace we're growing uh we're growing and so is our selection there's now a world of great soft craft beers waiting for you to reach out and try don't thank us, thank the beer. Oh, don't thank us, like the beer, it's our pleasure. And then there's there's just more bollocks like that. Uh, but it comes in a pink can, which is why I think my daughter got it, and I've tried it, and it's fucking awful, fair do. It's, and it's, it's 8%, you said, Lee? It's 8%. I you think be I, careful now on that. You want to be very careful. Oh, if I put a straw in it, the straw would stand up. It's up. I mean, I've I've had worse tropical. It doesn't taste quite so pineapple-y as some of them, but yeah, I can't quite put my finger on what it tastes. Does it taste eight percent though? Does it taste really strong? <laughs> I'll tell you in about fifteen minutes, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. God, how long is the George North Rank going to be this week? Yeah, when I, when I, that when was I start... literally about to tell me to say as I wait till we get onto the game when and we mention George North. Yeah, you can tell I'm on an eight percenter when I start arguing with Harley about like the science and stuff. Then that's that's proper eight percent arguing. That is. All right, let's let's move on to news desk while we can. So Jamie, whole lot of stuff to get through, mate. Over to you. Yes, loads of news to get through, and it's all coming from the capital, the checkbook, Charlie's. So. Start off, former Italy international Cornel Van Zio will link up with Cardiff as forwards coach next season. So Van Zio is currently assisting Ealing Trailfinders following the collapse of London Irish, where he had held a similar role since 2021. And then today, Cardiff have announced that they've signed Gavin Jenkins on a full-time deal as defence coach. So Jenkins was working as a part-time defence consultant this season, but he's going to take uh, the job on full-time in the summer. So that's good news for Cardiff. Um, who else have they got? Yes, they've brought in uh, Stefan Emmanuel um, back to the club from Bath's Academy. So he is an 18-year-old that made the switch over the bridge while he was attending Millfield School. But now he's going to return to the Blue and Blacks when his studies are complete. And then in disciplinary news then, Cardiff centre Ray Lilo has been banned for four weeks following his red card against Connacht. So... Lilo's initial six-week suspension was halved due to his guilty plea, but was increased by a week as he has previously committed a similar offence. So that means he's going to miss the URC games next month against Leinster, Glasgow Warriors, Munster, and a Welsh Premiership uh, fixture against Newport. Because he would have played in our league. He obviously would have played in the Welsh Premiership against Newport. So, uh, yeah, they've included Darwin, which is very naughty, I have to say. But... Um, that's the Cardiff news. Moving West End, Tom Rogers, he signed a new deal at the Scarlet. And Amtel have confirmed the sign of Ewan Shenton on loan from the Scarlets in a deal that could last for the rest of the season. And then moving on to the Ospreys end, it's been announced today that Luke Scully has signed a new deal with Ospreys. Scully has made eight senior appearances so far for the Ospreys, so that's good news for them. And then um, finishing off then, 
news from last week has been a bit of a talking point in Welsh rugby. So on the eve of the Island Wales game, Warren Gatland had a bit of a dig at the regions and he called Welsh rugby, a, quote, a sinking ship. So basically, he said that right now, we are probably reflective of where our regions are. We've got to look up close in that gap. Everyone talks about the finances, and I understand that, but it's making the right decisions. Is more money going to go on buying players, or is the extra money going to be on fixing up the infrastructure, the facilities, and quality people in your backroom team? He also mentions um, Alex Mann. So um, he was at a sponsor's dinner and apparently Alex Mann answered this question with, and I quote, I now know what a professional environment is like and what it should be like. With Gatland adding, that's what we've got to encourage our regions to be like. So, um, yeah, I, I, it was, um, of course, a bit of a stir. I don't think it was particularly helpful to come out with those comments on the eve of a big game like that. And it does feel like he's hung, he's hung Alex Mann up to dry. A little bit. Um, yeah. What, what were your thoughts on Gatlin's comments? I mean, there are some fair points in there, but it just felt inappropriate and the timing was a little bit off for me. But what did you guys make of it? He's um he's right about Alex Mann though. He is training at a leisure centre next to his Umber class every week. Well he's not even doing that now. Because they've got yeah, a true. twin. They've got no, a training... twin. So they so it's gonna be a porter cabin in the, the north stand. Which really doesn't help. The, the the sort of uh, the Gatlin comments does it, I, and I remember when um, so Osprey is famously, if anyone's ever been to Clandarcy, um, obviously it's it's a it's a sport college as well as a gym, and then you have the rugby training facilities as well. So the Ospreys do have a private section of the gym, um, and then the speed track in the actual main compound. They obviously have the barn, which is primarily theirs. But the changing rooms to to go out onto their their changing rooms next to the pavilion um, were awful, and I remember changing them before, and they were genuinely it was like being in a bandwidth or something like that. Um, so they built like this elite um, elite sort of setup, but a sort of better changing room facilities, and they moved um, the Ospreys to St Helens in like a portable gym for the summer and uh, for a part of the season. And I remember just thinking this really doesn't help our standing as like an elite club and, and I know Cardiff are in a similar situation as well. So having time had time to mull it over, he's actually right. And and a lot of Gatlin's comments, as much as I don't like Gatlin, were taken out of context when he said the regions are failing, where actually what he really meant was they should be put, pumping all their monies into facilities, which I kind of get considering the Cardiff situation. You know, the Ospreys don't have the best you know, like a, a dedicated training centre, which is something that they want. So, yeah. But this this goes back. I agree with what he's saying, but the bit he's missing out is he's going, but this is partly my responsibility for the last 10 years for insisting everything was focused on the, the Welsh national team and nothing went out to the regions. You know? Well, WRU's like, responsibility, I would say, not not Gatlin's really. Well, but yeah, but he the was... Union. He was largely responsible for focusing a lot of the money and a lot of the effort on um, the Welsh team, on the national team, with this trickle-down effect. You know, we, we, we'll we have a, a really successful national team, and that will mean that all the regions will be successful, and it will trickle down. Yeah, that, that was his theory, that everything will trickle down. And it didn't, because the, the, the more successful we the the national team became we went all oh, right okay but to get to the next level i need this and i need this and i need this and that just sucked everything in so he's got to put a little bit of the uh his own hands up and, and and take a little bit of responsibility there and say that yeah some of the funding that came into the national center and the you know hundreds of coaches that have been working with players over the last couple of years may not have been necessary they may not be needed and some of that money and infrastructure should have gone back out to to the regions and they should have supported you know the likes of you, know, you can't have a professional team uh, or like you say training where where you're training it, it's just it's it's pathetic it's ridiculous scarlet's are lucky but even scarlet's last year refitted the gym and had to um go to a a, a local gym that they've got a partnership with but they then trade their, their gym work over last summer was all done in a public gym. 
because they were refitting their gym. So, uh, you know, and you guys are in that situation you know, permanently. It's just shit. But it costs so, money, doesn't it? That's the other thing. Like, of course, you want good facilities. Mm. Of course, you want good coaches and et cetera. But that costs money. Mm. And the regions don't have that, you know, with the exception of Cardiff now with the takeover. And that's what Gatlin needs to understand. Yeah, we all want our regions to be better. We all want the best coaches. But it costs money. When you've got the union cutting the funding, the, you know, it, it's difficult, isn't it? Well, as I say, I'm expecting an announcement out any time soon about WRU funding. The, 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 if, if the rumours are true and, you know, there's no reason to believe that they're not, then there will be a slight increase in funding next year across all four regions. So if, you know, fingers crossed and all that kind of stuff. But it won't be enough to pay for a gym. No, no, yeah. Isn't it? Is it enough to make a difference, well, though, and close the gap, isn't it? It's probably not going to be, is it? Yeah. I mm. just, just going back to the thing with the Cardiff, the leisure. I know we were all joking about with the leisure side of the thing, but the whole idea was going to be Cardiff Univer Cardiff um, rugby take over a leisure centre that was that basically seems like it's on the verge of folding anyway, and they were going to ha- ha- develop their own training facilities and a community facility as well. So then, you know, the community get to keep a leisure centre. And it's another source of income, which is something that we're constantly being told by the WRU we've got to do. Unfortunately, local residents and Cardiff Council dicked about too much, and that's why they've had to pull out. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's one of those things. But it's like Catelyn saying, oh, you know, they, they need they need better fitness and stuff like that one. Well, oh, you know, or they're not playing the game plan. You know, we want them to play. Well, the Six Nations is a seven, seven eight-week block. The Summer Tour is like another four-week block. What are you doing in the gaps between to earn this massive salary? You know, going, you know, there was huge praise when um, Sean Edwards came and helped Cardiff's defence a couple of, um, was it four or five years ago? Mm. And it was like, well, why aren't you doing that more? You know, if you're not happy with the way you and Lloyd's kicking, why isn't, why isn't Wellies down, down at the Scarlet's week in week out helping him, mm. helping him with his kicking? Well, given that we've got three relatively inexperienced head coaches, why isn't Gatlin working with the head coaches to go, hey, here's some of my experience, you know, let me let me help a little. I just It's well, a fair point though, know. isn't it? It, it is a fair and point. That is because a you could get Mike Froshaw down to the Dragons. They haven't got a defence coach. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So why not get Mike Foshaw down at Bustramanek for a day or two just to advise them? You know, could all the coaches in the Welsh setup help more with the regions? They probably could, couldn't they? What's interesting and is Gatlin has, been, Gatlin has been at the Ospreys a couple of times and the Ospreys have gone up to them because they put out like a a, um, a midway point like sort of interview with Toby Booth and they were splicing in some video clips and uh, Gatlin was at Handarsi watching the, the, the stuff, like watching everything. The um, Lance Bradley said to me in a tweet, uh, a few weeks ago, that Alex King was at like one of the Ospreys games. Clearly, they're not fucking watching the Ospreys players, but um, he must be in the bar or something. They're there for the hot dogs, mate. They're there for the yeah. half time hot dogs. That's it's, what it, it is. It's all about the Steve Barkley lounge. They've gone to the, Nan- <laughs> the new Nando's in the Morva. That's what they've got. That's what they've gone to. John Barkley. Yeah. Okay, let's um, let's move on then, Jamie. Have we got any more interesting news for this week, mate? No? I haven't. No, that's it. Okay, Cody. So that um, if, if people want to carry on with that Gatlin thing on our Twitter and our Facebook, we'll we'll put a a, a post out on our Facebook page and our Twitter. Crack on, because um, just don't expect us to reply because it gets a little bit tedious after a while. But by all means, do crack on with it. So, uh, James, let's have some beef and banter, mate. What have we got this week? Well, there there was a few contenders this week until. Alan Partridge of Welsh Rugby decided to pipe up again. Um, Sean Hawley, uh, like uh, like Thomas Shanklin did the other week, put out the the Wales fifth twenty or fifteen that he wants to see against France. And there were a few like sort of there was nothing like too drastic, you know. He put Dylan Lewis in at three, weirdly put Mackenzie Martin at six, you know, despite the fact he's twelve. Um, 
Then, you know, nine and 10, absolutely, you know, no issue there. Get to 12. Joe Hawkins. Um, <laughs> the, the ineligible Joe Hawkins. Um, and then it just, his credibility, I think, falls apart from there. And and someone pointed out on Twitter or, or X that it is clear no just engagement farming. Like, mm. all they want is the likes and the clicks. But they're, they're driving to... At some point, Holly's going to start calling him Joseph instead of Joe, just a, a, yeah. like, like Daniel. And, and clearly uh, coached him. <laughs> um, he's going to say he had a, he, he had a bet with Andrew he Hall. That, he, he had a bet <laughs> with Andrew Hall that this, this lad will never play for Wales or Ali name like he did with Justin <laughs> Tipperick. Um, but on there's a, there's a second part to this. So the Joe Hawkins thing is clear engagement farming. I refuse to give him the, mm. the time of day. Um as well as that, they had the 25-cap rule debate, again, um, with Alex Cuthbert. But the 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 bit I want to focus on is that Scrum 5 last week and uh, this coming week is cancelled, despite a full raft of regional rugby. Um, this, this just comes, you know, what? How many weeks ago when politicians were saying how they need to protect free-to-air rugby and rugby shows and things like that because it's an institution in Wales, yet they can't be bothered to show a 45-minute highlight show with a bit of analysis in there. Hmm. And don't get me wrong, Scrum 5, the quality has dipped over the years. Like, it is nowhere near as, you know, what it was when they had, like, you know, obviously you had the... The original iteration with "Where's my sources?" and "Tell me your sources," you know that was brilliant. Then you got like when they had that stupid little clubhouse with Sean Holly behind the bar, the pub you'd never want to go to because Sean Holly was behind the bar, um, and things like that. So like, that was great. And then it, the, the, it did just dip. The, the quality of journalists they were getting on was poor. The analysis was basic beyond belief. Lauren Jenkins has done a lot to restore credibility to that show. She's actually yes. fantastic. She's brilliant. But it is a sinking ship. And and I, and I genuinely think next season, we might not have any form of rugby analysis in Wales. That isn't Squidge. Well, this is where our uh, videos are, are, are meant to come in. <laughs> so, but we're only, we've been told this, we're only allowed to do 30 seconds, between 30 seconds and then one minute last of them so um I, I think you're right about it used to be good and somebody said this week they, they, they don't show as much rugby and it's all talk now uh, i think i don't think that's what it is i just i think it is the format it is i think i said i said this a couple of weeks ago just because you're an ex-player doesn't make you an expert you may have been very very good on the pitch it doesn't make you an expert. Yeah, and there are a lot better people do, actually doing the job. Yeah, when Scrum 5 started, being a rugby analyst wasn't a job. You can do university courses in it now, you can do a degree in, in, in sports analysis. Yeah, so the people that we've now got doing analysis aren't actually doing the analysis. They just go, well, when I played, you know, we did this, this, and this, and somebody will put a video in front of them and they'll go, okay, yeah, look at this, at this. Um, Sam Warburton is the, the one exception to that, where Sam Warburton will actually go, right, I want you to look at this, and I want you to look at this, and that player there, uh, the, let's see the bit he did about um, like players falling around the wrong side on a ruck. You know, six, seven Welsh players, go, there you go again, there you go again, there you go again. And he's he's taking a point and he's showing how that point is influencing the game and illustrating it with a series of videos. And I think on Scrum Fire, you think, like you say, it's just clickbait. It's just how can we how can we separate this into a 30 second clip that can go out and I can put it on my Twitter feed and everyone will love me. And I think it's worse for it. Myself, I, I, I think that's I, everything. Yeah, but I, I haven't watched Scrum 5 now for... Actually, I haven't watched it at all this season. and Not at all. It just And I don't feel like I'm missing out on stuff. Do you know what I mean? I just want to pick up on the pundit thing, because it is something I've, I've long believed that the most talented players tend to make the worst pundits, because I feel like they don't 
have to work or think to do it. They just instinct like Shane Williams, literally all his talents in his feet. He was an absolutely electric player. But my God, is there nothing going up north of north of his ankles? <laughs> that it's but then you've got Sam Warburton, who's reportedly is someone who was never the most considered the most talented, but he worked harder than everyone. You know, that was the reason why he was Gatlin. Mm. He's the archetypal Gatlin player. And, you know, and Dylan bit... Hartley, another one who's actually an incredibly good analyst. David Flatman mm. in, in a different way, because he's actually got he somehow manages to explain something that's quite hard to explain, but with enough humour that you it, mm. it just feels like it's a joke. The, the bit I always and then you get other ones with... who just seem to try to make jokes and it's awful. Yeah. With 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 punditry and sport. Is the one I always uh, I find interesting was the Jamie Carragher thing, because Jamie Carragher was he was good, good you know, sort of really good centre back for for uh, for Liverpool and, and for whatever, but when you wouldn't put him in like the upper echelons, right? But he was he absolutely just loved football and would study every part of it, and that's what Sam Warburton is as a pundit. Yeah. Like he he is like if you watch American sports when they do the technical stuff. He's that guy you go to. Whereas, like da- apart from David Flatman, if you take up the scrum bit, he's just he is like some funny anecdotes or some like witty band, like actual funny witty banter, not Ben Kay and Austin Healy like level of witty banter. Like, oh, but uh, like Austin Healy, as much as a dickhead as he is, really good analyst of the game. Like really, <laughs> when, really when, smart. When he's focusing on it, yeah. When he's when he's actually watching the game. He, I, I'll watch TNT, and he's like genuinely on it with some of the stuff that he's saying. But the Scrum Five stuff is just awful. The, the it, bit I like is when Shane Williams and Tom Shanklin start talking about scrummaging and lineup, and you, and you go and like seriously, boys, where this is a time when you shut up and let some just be quiet. And have silence and let us watch the game because you're not really adding anything to it and your analysis of a line out. But Tom Shankin uh, said once on a, a line out, and you could you can see both players are you know and this guy's well supported. I can't remember who it was a club game, but some guy's going up well supported and he's you know he's like eight foot ten foot off the ground, whatever ridiculous amounts. And Tom Tom Shankin goes, he's got off the ground well there. That's an excellent jump. No, no, he's he's jumped about two foot, and the rest of it is the guys have lifted him, and you can quite clearly see that because there's nothing else there that isn't a jump, Tom. That's that's a lift, and that's it's quite not. clear. In fairness, they do still. All, I know you like when you played. It was before jumping and lifting was allowed in the line out, but uh, yeah, mm. they, they still call it a jump. But it is. It's it's not just the jumper. It is all three. You know, having someone who is trying to get back into the habit of going up in the line out. Which also, first time doing it after 16 years. Fucking shit myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> was it snow up there, was it, Harley? Were you up there looking down and going, oh, they look small? <laughs> oh, seriously. Like, you know, we do, you understand now why, do you understand now why Cardiff drop all their lane notes? <laughs> because it's so scary up there. It's cold Lovely. up there. It's cold, man. Hey, I said and they've got taller players than we do in our, we had in our pack. So, you know, you go up even further. Right. But no, yeah, you, I, I do get what you mean. The other one that really annoys me that, and it's a, a lot of pundits do it, is they'll start trying to guess what the referee's given it for, and they'll say, "Oh, yeah, you know, oh, he was on the wrong side there." It's like, no, he's given it to the other team because he's sealed off, <laughs> or it's, mm. oh, well, you know, oh, you know, oh, that was that was a you know poor penalty to give away by Gareth Thomas, was it? No, he's pinged Azarati for standing up. Like, just listen to the referee; he will tell you what the penalty's for. But that's that's where you need us boys doing uh, a YouTube live feed going, well, what the fuck's that for? What the fucking cut referee? Fuck's sake, man. He's just reflecting what people are thinking at home. That's what it is. Anyway. So you can you can get any old idiot to just say, complain about the rest giving the wrong decision. Exactly. And and we'd be good at it. And we'd swear. <laughs> so, um, right. Let's let's move on. Harley, what have we got for a, a stat blast this week, mate? Um... Couple of things, not not many pretty ones. So, uh, first of all, this this game is really following the trend for Wales for Wales Island because the last seven the last seven the last three games in the first half we scored zero po- we scored zero points we scored three points and we scored zero points again and then seven points each in the second half. Um, on the plus side, 
we're below average on points conceded against Ireland this year in the Six Nations because we only conceded 31 points and the average is 35. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and we've made like a billion, squillion, zillion tackles, which is just basically every Ireland game. We make it, a billion, zillion, squillion tackles. It's just meant to be encouraging us, Harley. <laughs> we're we're no. below the, the, the 35 point average for an Ireland game. Yeah, so we we're doing better. We're doing better than the other two worst teams in the competition. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's let's move on to the the island game then. So let's let's start with the forwards. Harley, what what did you make of the forwards' performance? It's a bit it's a bit hard because you've got to you've got to remember that a lot of these have you know we do have a couple of quite new. Forwards in there. For the most part, the lineup worked quite well. I know when Elias came on, that first lineup was wonky, but actually, if you look at it, if you look at it, it's the camera doesn't stay on it long enough, but you can see the island sort of just nudging. I think it might be um it's either I think it might be an Omani. He sort of just just gets the nudge on Wainwright, and that sort of stops him quite getting getting to the ball, so you get the overthrow. I mean, when we were picking and going, it was all right until we were right up in the line, and then I think they were so busy with the pick and go they didn't hear. Young Casello trying to get him to go wide. But I mean, we were just, over, I mean, I'm trying to be positive in it. But we were overpowered. As Verratti knew, you know, he's still so relatively young to international scrummage and he didn't know how to get to get the point, you know, how to deal with Porter coming in at 45 like he's going to do. Um, Peter Omani's innovative um, captaincy <laughs> by, hold, by physically holding Porter's elbow in place. Just absolutely mm. wonderful. I am so so here for that <laughs> because normally with my free arm when I'm scrimmage, I'm using it to try and catch the opposition scrum off. He's actually doing it constructively for the scrum. So, what I for me the the the, the weak bit was a scrum in the first half, and then changed around with substitutions and whatever in the second half. But we did lose a little bit of mobility around the the pitch. Um, I thought our back row were immense in defence, that just on disrupting. You know, yeah. If you look at how many times Wainwright got himself in between the Irish ball carrier and his support players and just slowed that up, um, I thought that was superb. I thought Alex Mann and Mackenzie Martin both had really good games, a like really strong game. I think yeah. when Alex Mann puts on another stone, stone and a half of, uh, uh, of muscle, he's going to be awesome because it is technique, his tackle technique is is superb. It's just not necessarily dominant. I think that's where we're missing at the minute. We're just not dominant. We're not dominant uh, enough. I think Will Rowland's brought a little bit of ball carrying dominance, but not enough. And I think, you know, Ireland have probably got six ball carriers in their pack, big, heavy ball carriers. And, and we've probably got Will Rowlands on for half a game. And, and I think it showed. So, you know, I think there were a lot of positives in there for us. But there was also a lot of, you know, this is where you need to aim. This this is this is the level that we need to work at if we're going to do anything. And uh, I don't think it's necessarily personnel. I think that they're, 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 there's a good bunch of, of players there that will be strong for the future. And I think there's some players to come back. Jack Morgan and Plumtree will add something when they come back in. Um, and I think that competition for places is something that we should be relishing. That's, that's something that we should be, you know, everybody needs to be up in their game when, you know, when players come back from injury and, and not sitting on this idea that, you know, getting out of a, a Gatland squad is more difficult than getting into it. So, yeah, I think I think there's a lot of stuff to come. There's definitely more to come from those players that are there. Um, but yeah, we were just outpowered, just so overwhelmed, and powerful. So. One, one thing I do want to say is, that, you know, we did actually have relatively quick ball for most of it. So over, so fifty six percent of our rucks were. Over, I mean, admittedly, Ireland had sixty percent of rucks under three seconds, but you know, fifty six percent of rucks under three seconds actually quite quite good for a Welsh mm. performance. I think the problem was is. We it was the lack of clinical edge. Um, I don't know if um, Jamie or James want to talk about it when we go on to the backs, but I also feel like we were a bit naive, like you know, when we had easy kickable opportunities when we were like 7 0 down or 17 10 or 17 7, and you're like, 
you know, those three points would, you know, they, they're keeping us in the game. Mm. And that's that's one thing, like, before J- James makes his restoring pride joke, so, you know, that's one thing Cardiff have done quite well this season is, you know, they they, they, will, they will take those three points just to keep themselves in the fight, to, to give themselves an opportunity to try and win or draw mm. afterwards. Um, I do think, you know, it, it, it showed, like, that, that clip... Um, Oh, what's the same? Rian Lowe shared of Dylan Lewis, and you could see he was, even though he'd only been on the pitch for an half hour, how knackered he was because of violence tactics of trying to hit the same player to make tackles all the time. Mm. And you know, and you'd see it in, in this one period of play, he made he made like two, three tackles and a counter ruck in like a forty second clip. You know, so you know they put an effort in, and the fact we, you know, it took Ireland till the very last play to score a try. To score that bonus point try, I I think they can take a lot of pride from that. Said the pride word again. So um, <laughs> before we 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 move on and we discuss the the backs, so I want to get everyone's opinion on the incident with the boot, because <laughs> that for me, yeah, see for for me that play went on for six seven minutes without his boot. And it wasn't like what well, the boot wasn't in the way, wasn't obstructing anything. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't preventing anybody from playing. It wasn't a danger. He could have just moved it to the side. Yeah, but he didn't. He tried to fucking hurt it 20 odd meters or whatever just because he was being a stroppy little kid. So if that was me, I'd have, I'd have gone absolutely fucking mental with him and called it back for a, a, a you know, I'd start a fight of some sort and when the ref looks back at that he goes actually that's ungentlemanly conduct so you've got a 50 50 call there of him getting a penalty so for for me it was just poor to being a twat but your thoughts i mean porter is is, was being a twat but also Mm. if that was a welsh player i'd be calling it brilliant shit housing so i'm gonna i've got to stick with it i think that's i think that's funny you're right. What you know, how it reacted to was just like, oh, I lost my boot. When you know, you could have got a bit of a kerfuffle, and, and then and then it's like, oh, hang on. Well, no one one mm. instigated it by throwing the boot. Yeah, but I, I'll be honest, I found it funny. You two need to grow. It's, up. It's, <laughs> I was blindside last weekend. Did the exact same thing to the opposition, and even you know, and the opposition were just like, "Fuck that!" Nah, <laughs> that I'd, have, I'd have fucking gone for him. But yeah, yeah, go on, James. Word as a prop, what would you do? Fuck all. I'd have fucking had him. <laughs> so he, he takes your boot, he throws it twenty odd meters away, and you've got to stay playing for six minutes. Yeah, and. He's running around and you're running around there. With I've one played without a shirt your... before, Lee. It doesn't that's, matter. That's because they didn't want you on the pitch, mate. That's different. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had my shirt pulled off in a rock and I just sort of left it. I was just playing in my, in my, and it was like it was like America football pads as well. You know, like they cut right just above the belly. So I was playing. Oh God, in that's that. worse than the opposition. The yeah, bra, exactly. that is, mate. I had about, I had about a forty odd meter run. They just didn't want to come near me. Um, <laughs> Also, I appreciate how you, you ask Harley about the front row when, <laughs> you know, prop. Um, yeah, but none well, of us no are proof. backs. We've got no backs, mate. We, none of us are backs. So well, you, some I, of us I are going to have to comment on the back. this season, to be fair. I just want to very quickly <laughs> touch on Azerati. I want to touch on Azerati. And this is where his naive, naivety as a test level prop comes in. And he should have play acted to fuck about Andrew Porter and and dri- not driving in on the ang- uh, on driving on the angle sorry and it was he was and what I will say is Azarati did not paint himself the best picture with the referee because he buckled very easily under that and what under what Porter was doing and he gave the ref no choice as a prop I remember you, before I joined the the show I remember Lee talking about this when Osprey beat Scarlet. So it was a Thomas Lozano red card game, and Lee went on about a twenty Which minute, one? yeah, <laughs> twenty minute rant about Nicky Smith and his scrummaging. Yeah, and it's exactly the same as what Porter does. In that he, do, he doesn't drive in on, doesn't drive straight. But what tight ends don't do is they don't sell it, and that's what Azarati 
did do it. He didn't sell the fact that Porter was doing this. He was buckling. And Dylan, uh, obviously Dylan Lewis didn't get a chance to do this because Porter stays on, uh, goes off, sorry. But that's what you've got. That's the that's difference between club level and test level. You've got to you've got to take every opportunity you can. And I, and I just think, I don't think that was Azarati's best game in a whale show. He only made four tackles. He, he didn't carry much. I, I, he, I, I think he was so, I think there was so much mental capacity there just trying to get that one in on Andrew Porter. And you do as a prop, you spend so much time fixating on getting, the, getting one on your opposite number that sometimes the rest of your game suffers. Like, he didn't carry like we wanted him to. He didn't tackle. He made four tackles, one dominant hit, right? You know, Gareth Thomas, we know his, uh, I highlighted on Twitter this week, his USP is that chop tackle. Like, that one he puts in, um, and then Tommy Rafael goes straight over the top. He's been doing that for four or five years at the Ospreys. In the, it, I think that front fight, you talked about the back row league working really well as disruptors. I thought the front five were brilliant. In terms of that, that starting front five were brilliant in terms of work rate. I've got here the tackle count. That, uh, yeah, but they were shit. No, we, got, we got completely fucked in the scrum in the first half, mate. Yeah, That's no, what I'm, saying, I'm not, it? I'm not yeah. talking about the set piece. I'm talking mm. about um, Dav Jenkins, 17 tackles. Uh, Adam Beard, 13 out of 13. Elliot D, 11 out of 11. Gareth Thomas, 11. Um then you've got an Adam Beard had three three dominant hits off 13 tackles with none missed. It's fucking brilliant. And what you talked about, Lee, is when Roland came on, yes, he had that carrying game, but mm. I actually think we lost a bit of um bit of grunt in the tight. So where Ireland scored that last try is very much one up runners, right? Or to little tip on runners playing off ten. And you just lose that bit of coherency in the tight. It's a really, really weird thing in the in the second row for Wales at the minute because you've got Will Rowlands who's a fantastic carrier as Jamie will attest to you've got Dav Jenkins who he hit 30 yeah he hit like 30 plus rucks on the weekend plus making 17 tackles yeah he misses he probably misses more than he should then you've got Adam Beard who's in that tight is making dominant hits who's making tackles so it's you've got a really competitive second row and that's with young players to come through as well. Hmm. And I think so, that's a good thing. I think that I think that's, that, that's uh, yeah, what we need. We need more of that. But anyway, just right. Before, just, Jay- just before we move on, okay. just, let's get Jamie involved. I, I was going to say, Jamie, to, oh, Jamie's going to lose the ability to speak. If no, it's fine. Go on, chances. Ali, quickly. Go on, Ali, I, I, just want, I just want to know, um, it's open to the floor, but obviously during the Pivac era, Humphreys was always moaning about players' scrums being illegal and he wanted to be a pushing contest. Do you think he's coaching, or rather not coaching, the props in in Wales camp to to try and like show off all these illegal scrimmaging things? You know, and is he saying just focus on pushing, pushing forward, pushing straight? And do you think that's where like because we we've had these issues with scrims before now where props will get away with what they get away with, whereas we're always trying to go straight and we're never trying to like actually eat the penalties out. I think we suffer from a lack of. An actually mammoth strong tight end. So when but when we had Adam Jones, right, you could afford to have Gethin, who Gethin, who we love, right? We love Gethin. But Gethin went through a period of his career where he gave away so many scrum penalties, right? He he he, he was and yeah. a, a part of that is down to referee's interpretation. But you can always be bailed out when you've got someone like Adam Jones on your right. What we have got at the minute is we've got props. Not I'm saying can't scrimmage because it absolutely can, but we we haven't got like that mana for the tight end. And it's probably the closest one is Azarati, still very green. Dylan Lewis isn't a mammoth tight end. Archie Griffin's not a mammoth tight end. Leon Brown is, but he's never off the fucking physio table. You know the only probably the only mammoth like actual massive tight ends in Wales. Were Samson Lee just retired? Tom Boater, who's thirty nine, um, and like well, I think Lloyd Fairbrother's huge as well. Am I right, Jim? He's a big boy. Yeah. Well, he's well. Yeah, he's huge. He's not 
particularly big, which is where I think but, I'm yeah, but he's, he's one of the heaviest he's, players in the squad. He's, but he's wide, yeah. you know, he's short, he's quite wide, which is what you want from a tight end. So Arthur I think Griffin, though, he's about 140 kilos, but he fucking went back like just he was 40 years <laughs> Jamie, go on. What am I supposed to be talking about now? The backs, is it? I was going to say, let's yeah. let's talk about the pretty boys. We we've talked about the genuine talk part about of the team. Let's talk about the right, pretty let's... boys. Let's talk about the backs. So I think Wales's attack is a big problem. Um, that first half in particular was a very tough watch because the backs had no platform whatsoever. Mm. And we spent most of that first half on the back foot and under the cosh. We didn't enter Ireland's 22 until the 36th minute. We took a very long time to actually, actually get the ball off Ireland, and that was a problem. The discipline was pretty bad, which is disappointing because we conceded nine penalties in that first half alone, which is what we conceded against Scotland and England put together in the first two games, and that had a big influence on the first half. But um, the problem is, you know, if you haven't got a platform, it's very difficult for the backs to express themselves, isn't it? And Rob Howley talked about rugby chaos. I think the game plan was to go there and play an attacking game. But when your scrum is, you know, going backwards and you've got no platform, it's just very difficult for the backs to, ex- to express themselves. And the problem was when we did have the opportunities, we were much better in the second half, by the way, um, we, we just weren't clinical enough. And Warren Gatlin said after the game, we probably weren't as clinical as we wanted to be. And we didn't impose our attacking game as much as we would have liked. So clearly we were going to go there with some intent and purpose. But because we spent most of the game on the back foot, because Ireland were controlling possession and territory, you know, we just could not get the ball off them. It was very, very difficult. And, you know, I thought the half backs were okay. Um, there's been a lot of talk about Sam Costello. I thought he was all right. You know, I know there's a lot of people bashing him at the moment. And Steph Thomas wrote an article for Wales Online today saying the Welsh public need to give him more time. And I agree. The fact of the matter is we don't have that experience 10 anymore. We don't have Anscom. We don't have bigger. We've got what we've got and we need to stick with them now. And I will say on uh, Costello, I thought his defensive shift was excellent. He made 17 tackles. He put in some really big hits. There was one try saving tackle as well. I can't remember who we did it on, but I watched it on Scrum Feed. It was a try saving tackle. And um, also as well, the ref. Did anyone else note this? So Thomas Williams gets penalised for a crooked feed, which you just don't see enough of anymore. Yeah. He, he gives that, and you think, right, okay, that, that's unusual. You don't see that. Fine. Jameson <laughs> gives some park in the very next scrum, Straight just the as crooked, row. if not more, and he doesn't get called. He oh, literally into the second Point row. Order. Yeah, <laughs> if it's it the worst thing it is, it wasn't ridiculous. for a crooked feed. It's for mm. showing the ball and not putting it in. Basically, because Ireland are pushing early basically every scrum. Thomas goes down, stands up to basically say, no, I'm not happy with this. And then Piardi pings him for not put, feeding the ball. Yeah, no, Jamie, I, Jamie's on about the one where he specifically yeah. said, he, he said, it was a crooked, was a crooked feed. He, said, yeah. he specifically yeah. said, it's a crooked feed. And you're right, the next scrum. Yeah, I Jamie mean, Gibson Park did exactly yeah. the same. Like, the worse, second row were going like, oh, I I'm just, uh, what the hell's happening? It's, yeah. I'm not talking about Andrea Piardi because I will get angry. Yeah, you will. Yeah, you, have seven, you, you have more reason than most, to be fair. Right. So, Here's something to think but, about, though, right? Go on in. We've played six halves of rugby in total, yeah? In three halves in this tournament, we haven't scored a single point. Mm. You know, we've still yet to put in an 18-minute performance. But on other individuals, can win it again, who I've just continued to be impressed by. I mean... He's almost half penny like his knee, his positional play. He's so good under the high ball. He was getting a load of plaudits after the game. Lots of Irish fans saying how good he was and how impressed they were with mm. him. And he has been one of the big highlights for me of this campaign. It's been a struggling campaign, but can win it. It's been incredible. Um, I actually thought, I know you'll disagree with me, as you always do. I thought George North had a very good game. I thought so, that he made some very good defense. Hang on, you yeah, you have say yeah. now. He had some very good defensive reads. Yes, I would have liked to have seen a lot more of attack from him, you know, a lot more ball in hand. But uh, I thought defensively, he was probably one of the best mm. games that I've seen him have. I also enjoyed Gordon Darcy calling him James North. Uh, I don't know if any of you noticed that on ITV comms. 
Um, Rio Dyer worked incredibly hard, but I think the story for the backs was they didn't have the platform they needed to express themselves, so they couldn't create the rugby chaos that Howley wanted. But when they did get those opportunities, they simply weren't clinical enough. And um, Harley mentioned it earlier, turning it down three points at crucial moments. You know, that's one of my bugbears. I hate that. You've got to get some points on the board just for a little bit of momentum. I thought that was bad decision-making. But, um, yeah, a tough day for the backs, not helped by not having a platform. Wait, Lee, so, are you going to so talk about Joe's North? No, no, I'm going to I'm gonna literally do two sentences, yeah, and me and you are not going to have an argument. So <laughs> my my point with Joe's North is, is it actually thought in attack – when he had the ball, you could see why he's on the pitch, because you know there, there were a couple of times where he gets caught behind the game line. He's scooping up shit ball, and he's actually he's actually doing the forwards job. He's actually driving the ball forward, and he's 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 providing a bit of bulk. He's providing a bit of a go forward. So from that point of view, you know, I thought he he was okay. I, I can't remember a single time where that ball actually came to him as a as a as a line as a backs line, let's go forward. Do you know what I mean? So I, in attack, I think he did everything he possibly could have in it in attack. I've not got a problem with him in attack. If you look, he keeps getting caught in two minds behind the ruck. He he's he's running behind the ruck and he stands behind the ruck and then waits to see what happens. And I think there were three, maybe four occasions where he's done that, and then he bites in. On an inside centre, or a, or a, whether it's the the fullback or the inside centre coming in on him, yeah. And when he's doing that, the the, the centre is taken care of, or the fullback is taken care of. That inside player has got that player, yeah. And what it means is that there's then a two or a three man overlap outside him. And if you listen to the to some of the commentary, it's like that's George North on another really good covering tackle. So he's making the tackle. But he's making it where he's chasing the player back five meters instead of blocking that that pass coming in, and this is what I I don't think we're being very fair to him because he doesn't play thirteen at the Ospreys. I'm, I think he's played two games this season, James. At thirteen, hasn't he? he? He's not. Uh, he's been at thirteen this season. Yeah, every time he's played, he's been at thirteen, but he's gone off. Uh, he went off injured at the Lions. He played thirteen. Yeah, so every time he's played it's at 13, he's not played on the wing for the Ospreys in a while. So, so he's almost he's learning that position at international level. And that's why I don't I don't think we're being very fair to him. And this was his best game though for Wales in a very long time, in my <coughs> opinion, especially in defence. I thought he was very good. But he's still way below where you need an international, particularly outside centre. Yeah, outside so, outside centre needs to be that player that that controls that line. But my my point is is we're not be we're not playing him in in his best position. Yeah, I thought Adams was Adams is out of form. Yeah, yeah. Put, put George North on the wing. Yeah, and bring George North outside Costello as your attacking twelve. Yeah, don't put him there in defence. I don't. No, put him back on the wing in defence. But as an attacking option, we we don't have anybody. We don't have anybody in the forwards. Will Rowlands is the exception. Wayne Wright will will run when he's got space. Yeah, the best bit of Wayne Wright on Saturday was when he had like a 30, 40 meter run up and he just bang and he he just hit. It. I thought that was fantastic. It it just showed a bit of a bit of grunt. But we need somebody coming outside Costello to take that ball off Costello and take that 10, 15 metres. And George North has done it a couple of times in the past, not intentionally. Yeah, he's he's come there off second phase and he sucks players in and creates the space outside him. So if we're going to play George North on that pitch, we need to use him at the best of his ability, not use him to plug a gap. That's what we're doing at the minute. We're using him to plug a gap and it's... It's not fair on him, and he he's trying to learn a new game at thirteen, and at international level against some of the best thirteens in the world, and it just it's not it's not there. Plus, you've got the you know we're not going forwards, so he's one of those players who could 
actually give us go forward. And that's why I say you swap in with Adams on the wing and and bring him off Costello, or even bring him off off nine, whoever's in at nine. You know, bring him off nine and and let him run at people because that is where he's good. That's where he does damage. And that's what I think we, we that's what we're missing. We're missing that that Jamie Roberts figure. As much as I hated Warren Ball, and that let's give it to Jamie Roberts and he's going to go forward ten meters. He also sucks in three players, and, and that's where that's what we needed on Saturday, and and it wasn't there. And when you've got George North at thirteen, you're not using him to the best of 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 what he does. It's like you know, take a prop and put a prop there. You know, that's not that's not what they're there for. George North is a dynamic runner. He's a fast, dynamic runner. Give him the ball, let him run at people in space. He's not getting it at 13. That, that's that's my point with, with George North. Not that he shouldn't be on the pitch, but if he's going to be there, put him at 11. That was the longest two sentences of my life. It was a very long sentence, mate. I'll give you that. It was a very long sentence. <laughs> <Yeah>. was... <laughs> right, but we're, um, not gonna, we're not going to argue. I was Come just going to put one more thing on, unless James has got an urgent point. But the one thing I noticed watching the game and watch it, you know, having to watch back, so I watched the first half. Then went to Bath, watched Real Murray, came back home and watched the second half. And um, the problem for me is everyone knows that George North is our punch in, in midfield. So what they did, but the problem is, is Tompkin, you always have Tompkins in 12, North at 13. And the best centre partnerships will we'll switch it around. I don't know if that's just because it's still quite early days in the Alex King attack. But the thing is, you could see Ireland were rushing up and then Tompkins then has to take the ball himself. Because he can't get that ball out. You know, when he can get the ball to North, we make really big ground. And I don't know if we, you know, we need to start having North coming in at twelve. Just to sometimes, especially if we're starting to lose momentum and go backwards. Just so you know, you know, Marcus Smith and Harlequins has Esther Hazen as a release valve. Whichever Springbok fly half or Fafter Cluck has Damien Dealandy. You know, you've just got this. You know. Ireland use Bundy, Aki, Stuart, McCloskey and Robbie Henshaw this effect. It's just having a player who can come straight off 9 or 10. And it's just very frustrating. You know, I I, I am getting a bit fed up of the, oh, Tompkins is getting battered, the poor lad. It's like he's a professional rugby player. He, fuck off, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> he got <laughs> ragged on so many times. It's like, watching a, it's like watching my dog play with a new squeaky toy. It's ridiculous. Yeah, but, but you do have a point in the fact that if you want, if you're going to put him in that position, you know, like the reason Tompkins is in the side is because of his distribution game more mm. so than his than physicality. Mm. Just switch him around for these things, you know, just keep him guessing because North is going to draw a few players, and if it means then that they're drawn in on North and you go back and you miss him to Tompkins, then we're actually going to get these balls to the wingers. Like everyone's moaning about Josh Adams' form. Well, he barely gets the fucking ball. Like if they're kicking, mm. they're kicking to Dyer. If they're passing, it goes out to Dyer. And, you know, he has done some nice things where he's come round to link up. I mean, I do agree he's not fully fit. He's not fully informed. My problem is I have no idea, idea who we replace him with because Grady, when he's chucked down on that right wing, has the exact same problem. Grady's great if you give him the ball, but he's still not quite ready to learn and to work and to actually find the places he needs to inject into the line. Well, that, that brings so. us on to the, the next bit then. So... Jane, so talk to me about tactics and changes. So, did we where did we get the tactics right? Where did we get the tactics wrong? And do you change the chat tactics or do you change a player? So is that to me or James? Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, you two. I'm gonna Thanks. have to call you Bill and Bob. Let, let no, James come in on this one. Yeah, on he's on been yeah. spoke on this one. Um, in terms of what do you bring in for France? I think we're at a point now where we either say we stick with what we need. So in almost at the Scarlet's issue this season, Lee, of consistency and selection, yeah? Mm -hmm. So we either say we stick with as close to the 23 that played out in Ireland against France, right? Which he's done for pretty much the pack, uh, barring a few, right? Uh, And say, right, continuity, you boys... Is a wounded France team. They've lost Jalibert today. Um, they're not going to have Dante. They'll have Valenza back, but will they trust him to go back in? Yeah, it's the wounded France team. They are 
there to be taken. You boys go out in Cardiff, put on a fucking show and beat them. Or is this the time now where you say, do you know what? We'll stick, uh, we'll stick. We, we, right, we know Alex Mann is now like a six, go, uh, an international six going forward. Let's put him on the bench, put Wainwright at six, Martin at eight. You know, do we, right, let's, you know, give Beard a rest, bring Teddy Williams out of the bench or, you know, someone like that. You know, do we pull the trigger and make mass changes where we essentially see you now, are these boys up to it? You know, do we, that, that's just, that's a dilemma we're at now. We, I think we have to stick with Thomas Williams and Costello. I actually think you, yeah. you stick with Kieran Hardy on the bench as well. Um, I don't see Gareth Davis really coming back into the squad. Um, if I'm honest, I think the whisper it quietly might be the end of Gareth Davis at international level. And that's not because he's bad. I just think the way Gatlin wants to play and then as well as the emergence of some young nines, you know, I, I just think that Gareth Davis might might not feature. Um, in terms of centre partnership, I, genu- I say it every week, but Joe Roberts could well come in. Um, uh, against France, he's not going up against Dante. He's not, you know, th- th- there's line break opportunities there against that France team. You got to remember, this is a France uh, coach, Sean Edwards, uh, a Sean Edwards coach, France there, who are getting carved up quite a bit. Italy carved up quite well on the weekend. That ball at the back. I think if you're going to have someone there, if you talk about Tomkins distribution game, which I haven't really seen much of, right? who is the perfect person to go out the back to, in this case, would be a Joe Roberts, because he's able to get on that outside and sort of go through. Um, other than that, you can't, I, I still think you stick with that front row of Gareth Thomas, uh, Elliot D and Azarati. I am concerned about, um, about the scrum coming against France. That was a, that, not so much the replacement France props, the started France props. Um, uh, and yeah, that's it. I think I genuinely think the big change I'd make though is I'd bring Mackenzie Martin in and just say, do you know what, mate? Have a go at eight. Run at people, run at that back row, make someone look silly and just say, we're going to put, it, it, we're, we're, we're going all in on you like we did with Falato all them years ago. You've got to build these kids up early. We've done it with Alex Mann, we've done it with Cam Winnett. The other one in the squad is Mackenzie Martin. He can restore pride in that Wales 8 jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Cardiff, right, we've pride. never lost pride Don't, in the 8 jersey. Uh, Jamie, oh. do we change personnel or do we change tactics? Because when we when we broke the game up on Saturday, when we did the, the tap and goes, when we did the cheeky line outs, when we did the the the... Uh, route one off scrums actually we caused island issues so tactics or people so i would keep changes to a minimum i don't think one gatlin's going to make uh too many changes for this one it is worth thinking about making a change in the back row because you can up against an almighty french pack and as good as alex mann has been for wales he is quite lightweight so i kind of get james's reasoning why not bring mackenzie martin into the fold, move Wayne right to six, and then you've got a bulkier back row. The scrum is a concern. Now, personally, I thought Dylan Lewis, can't believe I'm saying this, I've never been a Dylan Lewis fan. He did do well in the scrum. It might be worth starting Dylan Lewis for this one. Um, you know, Azarati had a tough time, but one thing I will say is, well, Porter was not scrummaging straight on, on a lot of those. He just wasn't driving in. He was boring in. You could see it, and we talk about Azarati being naive, but he's young, he's learning, and he'll come with time. But I think for this game against France, I probably would consider starting Dylan Lewis. But the biggest concern for me is who's going to get us over that game line because we have struggled all tournament to get over that game line. We look underpowered, don't we? When we compare ourselves to the other nations of this tournament, the bigger, more powerful nations, I just think we look underpowered and we saw it in Ireland. We, we really struggle to go over the game line. We're losing collisions. And when we're in the opponent's 22, we huff and we puff, you know, and then we get turned over. So it's um, it's a big concern for me. But 
I think we need to play a more positive brand of rugby. You know, we need to try and move the French about, we'll try and move that big pack around the field because we are not going to outpower France in the same way that we were never going to outpower Ireland or outmuscle them. So we need to be clever, smart and inventive in how we play the game and be a little bit more positive, I think. Hmm. So for me, we actually played that, what we used to call rollable, really well, where, where you go pick and goes, but it's a really quick pick and go, yeah? When Ireland do it, they're clearing players out six, seven foot beyond the ball and they're holding players in and they're getting away with it. Yeah. When when we do that, we do it really well. And the whole point of that is to suck players in. Yeah. Because they're going shit. If we don't go in, you know, half of our players are left on the floor. We need to go. So we suck players in and then nobody goes, now we need to move the ball out because there's space. We've created the overlap. And we need to use it. And I think those those are the bits that need to come with experience where we need forwards to listen and go, okay, we've done this. We, we, we've rollerballed two, three, four times. Okay, now I need to listen. Is that ball going out of the back? And, and Costello needs to start screaming for it because that's the bit that's the frustration where we we we're creating the overlaps we're creating it and but and then we're not executing beyond it um and I agree with you about you know and that's what I say about George not having somebody there to to give go forward and yeah i I was mulling over you know do you bring Grady in in place of Dyer and that's not saying Dyer, I don't think Dyer's put a foot wrong this year I genuinely don't I just think I I want somebody on both sides of the pitch that Costello can offload to. It's it's nah, you it's can't making... drop Rio Dyer right now. I, I know, think a we're... lot of people are calling for Adams to be dropped and they and bring yeah. Mason Grady in. So I mean I, but... I don't know. Josh Adams hasn't been himself, but I do want to see Mason Grady start at some point, mm. whether it's against France or Italy. I would like to see him get a start, but well, when you do start him, I suppose. Yeah, my, that's, that was kind of my point. We're bringing, if you've got two wings that can come off 10, then you, you're giving yourself, or nine and 10, then, then you're giving yourself options. But I don't, I, I say, I don't think Dyer's put a foot wrong. I think when it comes to Hart no, he himself, can't drop he's, him now. Yeah, he's right at the, I, again, you know, we, we've got to get to a bit where you go, actually, we, we've, Part of the problem with Welsh rugby over the last couple of years has been, you know, yeah, he's a good player, we can't drop him. He's a good player, we can't drop him. And and I think we do need to move move beyond it and go, do you know what, against certain sides, then you want Dyer there. And against some of the bigger sides like Ireland and maybe France, then, yeah, maybe you do bring Grady in and you have to play a different type of game against them. You know, you when we play Italy, we aren't going to play the way against Italy that we've played against Ireland. It's going to be a different type of game when you bring different players in that that, that tweak it differently. So that's it, that's where I think we are at the minute, but we don't have the depth that we need to, to have in order to play that kind of game, in order to say, right, we're going to play a wider game. We're going to play a more open game. So we put player A, B and C on. We're, we're going to need to play a tight game. We put players... D, E, and F on. So that's that's where I think we are at the minute. Anyway, right. This this beer is <laughs> repeating on me, boys. I'm telling you now, we're 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 well, three quarters of the way down. This is what's be not careful. My lead have eight percent. It's going to go to your head pretty soon. Oh, you be careful God, now. Man. Right. Let's talk about let's talk about the France Italy game because let's let's talk about something exciting. Let's talk about France Italy. Um because say my telly was on the blink all afternoon, so I had to watch all the rugby on iPlayer and um ITVX and it was really, really shit. And the screen froze on 80 minutes with a penalty he's just been awarded. I was absolutely <laughs> fucking livid. Ah. It was and and I was trying to, I, it was a nightmare. So I missed the drama with the the ball falling off the tee and all that kind of stuff. I, it kind of, it went from the penalty being awarded to him putting the ball on the, on the tee and then someone charging. And then it came back on just as the ball hit the posts and it, oh, it was 
absolutely awful. But what a game. What, what did you think of the finish of that game, boys? Harley, go on, you go first. I mean, the finish was really tense and excited. I mean, apart from, I mean, we were watching it on a slight delay because uh, we went over the in laws for a lovely lamb roast. Um, and it, yeah, it very, I'll be honest, it wasn't, I don't think it was that great a game in terms of an actual game. But the whole, you know, if they being so close to France and yeah, barely getting there. And all right, yes, it came down. And I'm going to say the same thing to say with the Scotland France game. Italy had opportunities to make sure that last penalty kick wasn't the deciding factor. There were plenty of opportunities they could have gone for post, but they didn't. They started going for the mall. Despite the fact their mall hasn't been going that well. Their lineup's been a bit iffy. You, know, you don't have goal kickers. I mean, it's, you know, it's a bit harsh, you know, with players charging up towards the penalty kick. I I don't know, the ball falling off, you know, that that happened. How that fell off? There's, there's no wind, you know, nothing. It, it, you know, it's this is it's a roof. There's a closed roof. What I want to know is, did the French papers have lots of arguments about whether or not Italy were deciding to have the roof open or not? <laughs> but and then Garbisi misses it, and you're just like, it just seemed exactly how what would happen for Garbisi given how f- absolutely torrid his season's been. Because mm. as much Should as I love Garbisi, taken though. Should that penalty be retaken? Because World Rugby say that teams should be awarded a penalty 10 metres in front of the original mark if an opposing team infringes on an unsuccessful kick. So a lot of people say that penalty should have been retaken. Mm. Mm. That's the big talking point from this game. Mm. I mean, as yeah, a drama... I feel like Christoph did a bit of a Joubert and ran away to, and just went, I don't want anything else. I don't want any more decisions in this game. <laughs> well, what did you make of it, James? The, the the finish. Don't ignore the seventy nine minutes. Just, just um, that, that last bit. Yeah, it's. I just feel for Gabisi. To be honest, I quite like Gabisi. Um, I like the Italy team. Um, it is just I felt for them there. You could just see how much it meant to them, uh, I, and just but it was that feeling of pride like that. In my mind, that's an Italy win, like no matter what. And I think a lot of the talk has been about how bad France were. And they were bad. I'm not taking that away. But from where Italy were against France in the World Cup to now, there's a lot of dog, a lot of fight in that performance. And it just comes down to one missed kick. You know, and it, it, it wasn't even like, he, he fucking shanked it wide. You know, it was like it was, you know, Cardiff in a cup quarter final and a semi final. It was, um, it, it was off the post. And that was with like, what, two and a half seconds build up? Mm. So, yeah, it, look, the Six Nations Netflix documentary is going to be fucking excellent next year. <laughs> So, final word on it then, Jamie. Who would you rather play next, France? Or, I know we are playing France next, but who would you rather play next? Would you play France coming off the back of a, a to all? If you read French media today, that was a loss, uh, and if you read Italian media today, you know that was a massive boost and a, a shot in the arm, and they they felt they should have won it. So, who would you rather play next? I, I think France, because I mean. You know, I watched that game against Italy and, yeah, it wasn't a great game, but there's something not right with France. And it's pretty clear that they really are missing Anton de Pont and Roman Intermac, probably far more than any of us realise, because don't forget, France were coming into this tournament as big favourites. But something's not right. I mean, they were very lucky to beat Scotland. And I said the other day, you know, they should be three losses from three, the same as us, but they're not. And... I feel optimistic about us in Cardiff, you know, because as James touched on, they don't have uh, Jalibert. That's a big loss. So they're probably going to play Ramos at 10. They're not going to have um, Jonathan Dante, another huge loss from fantastic player. If we get our basics right, then I, I do think that is a very winnable game because something is just not clicking there. And they're already starting to turn on Sean Edwards, aren't they, the French media? And, you know, mm. they really are starting to pick holes and, Golf is under a lot of pressure, so um, yeah, I, I feel confident we can we can turn France over. But the Italy game as well, I mean, that is going to be uh, 
probably going to be the wooden spoon decider, isn't it, for being honest. And that's not going to be easy because it, they have improved, you know. And uh, I was gutted from, I have to say. Well, I think we all wanted uh, Garbisi. We all wanted that, that kick to go over, didn't we? And when it hit the post, it was like, ah. It would have been brilliant for the tournament. It would have been absolutely fantastic, pure drama. But, um, yeah, I, I feel like we can give France a good game. I really do. And I wouldn't be surprised if we won. But that could be just Welsh optimism as well. I don't know at the minute. So uh, ask me the week after. I was going to say, you, you got two weeks before that. And there's a lot I know. happen in two weeks, mate. A lot But happen. two big losses, though, don't they? And Jolly Bit, two big losses for France. Mm. Mm. Okay. So uh, who wants to do the um, Fantasy League? Who wants to look at the Fantasy League it's and go? It's got to be me, in it? <laughs> Well, I forgot to do my team. I forgot to make my year. changes. That's what, I, that's what I did the, the previous week, and I scraped by. But this week, yeah. I I did really, really well. If you just take round three, I'm second in the table, boys. I'm fucking over the moon, I am. So if, I'm happy. Uh, so I, my team remained the same from the week before. Obviously, it didn't set a captain, so it automatically sent to Tom Ramos, which wasn't bad. But I had uh, I had uh, Duane Van der Merwe in the team, and I was like, "Oh my god, if I made the captain at the top right now!" But let's look at the rankings anyway. So in the rep league, in first place are uh, ironically wooden spoon contenders. <laughs> uh, second place, Ivan. Third place, oh, it's Ivan jumped up thirteen places by the way. Mm. Josh L uh, in third. Uh, Sior fourth, in it to win it fifth, Ethan Long sixth, Morgan Dobbin uh, joint sixth, uh, MJH Crusaders eight, old rubbish eight at nine. Is that you, Lee? No, mate, I'm those chaps in shorts. I am. I'm down in 34th because oh, okay. I was absolutely, I, I literally had three players who were suspended. <laughs> In my team from the week when I forgot to update it. So uh, down in down in sixteenth is me uh, climbing one place. Uh, who I am just above Jamie, who dropped down five places this week. Oosh. Uh, down to eighteenth. Uh, Harley, you're not in it. Uh, on Carwin watch, by the way, he's in fortieth. He's jumped up f- uh, five places. Uh, <laughs> Good old yeah, Carl. Lee, yeah. Lee, you're on 34. Uh, you're yeah. 34. You're on 999 points. You haven't even broke a 1,000 yet. No, but what I will say is if you look up by the round, yeah, so look on the little bit at the top, per round, second place. I was second is place it, in is round Is this three. like you trying uh, to convince, Yeah, this is... I don't is this like you trying to convince you, I, We won the 52nd, the 53rd yeah. minute all over again. Precisely. <laughs> it's all about the window that you look through. It's all about the context. Round three... We've got more lane breaks than you. So we are the better. We are the better rugby team. I'm just saying that one of us won uh, uh, one of those little shield things in round three, and it was me for uh, I had what's his name Waibosu, um yeah. as my super sub. And he had, I, I know, I know, we lost more points in than the whole points of the seven. But Johnny McNichol got a line break, and that is a win in my book. Fucking right on, man. Right on. Um, yeah, so that is the Fantasy League this week. Obviously, a week off. Um, we'll see who gets injured, who gets, who goes back to the clubs. We're um, who remembers yeah. to do their Fantasy League. You can tell who remembered to do their Fantasy League and uh, <laughs> who spent Friday night on the I was just very lucky that everyone in my Fantasy team from the last time I did it played like, and started. I was just very lucky with it. Can we talk about right. proper rugby? Please? Let's let's talk about rugby then. Let's start with. So we're gonna have to do because we're gonna run out of time again. So uh, Edinburgh Ospreys. So we'll we'll talk about Edinburgh Ospreys and then we'll go around the table and do our predictions on that. So James, you can do your free match uh, uh, rant if you like on Edinburgh Ospreys and then give us a prediction and then we'll go from there. Um, not a better opportunity to win. You don't win much away from home, and Edinburgh is a tough place to go. Um, and ironically, Edinburgh away is the catalyst for what this season is. So Edinburgh away last year, we had 
a lot of senior players in. I mean, Alan Wynn, Cuthbert North, all this. And we got fucking tonked, right? They took like a bonus point before half time. And Yestin, who co presents the Irie with me, is on the Welsh pod as well, was at the game. And there was a, census, a consensus among the squad that the senior players really let the Ospreys down at that point. And that was a catalyst for a lot of them not to have contracts renewed. And, and we're like, you're definitely gone. So in a way, that game uh, is the one we have to thank for what we have now, which is, you know, a young, a core group of young players probably performing better than the sum of their parts. Um, so we're five wins on the bounce, you know, fantastic run in the league. Dan Edwards, late drop goal. We've got to go up there with the confidence that we can win. And we can do this on the injury front. We're looking hopefully to have Reese Davis, Morgan Morris, and Owen Williams back. Which again, they might not all play, but having that quality back in the squad just makes it more competitive. Um, yeah, I I, I can't I, I can't really say much because I haven't really sat down and thought about it, other than the fact yeah. that you know that's all you the, do, James. That's, that's literally fact, your life. Other is than the about. fact, it's it's hashtag Edinburgh Week, right? <laughs> um, we're looking at you know when we won the league at Edinburgh uh, this week on Good Player, um, but no, it, it's it, it's just I, I, we want to continue that really good feeling in amongst the squad because our next run of games, right? It's fucking hard. You know, we've got Leinster away. We've got to go out to South Africa as well. So if we want to pick up top eights, right, which realistically you need um, 10 wins with a good couple of bonus points, right? So you need, uh, so if we want that, we have to win in Edinburgh. Then we have to be Dragons in Cardiff because, I look, as much as I love the fact that we won in South Africa, we're not going out with a win in there, nor are we winning at Leinster away. So what's, so, what's your prediction? Come on, no, what's your prediction? Uh, Scarlet's by one. Um, no, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to go Ospreys by five. Oh, I, I had you going Ospreys by ten. Okay, fair enough. Okay, I'm not that confident. <laughs> uh, Harley, justify your... Uh, Carly's a good boy. See, he fills in his sheet beforehand because he's he's just that way he's he's going to bring an apple in one week and go here you go sir have an apple go on harley what's to uh, justify your selection your prediction? Um, well, I, I, it's nice of you not to point out that i joke and he was james was going on about how amazing you know this this has been uh, i changed it to ospreys by a thousand but uh <laughs> <for him. laughs> um yeah so i've picked ospreys by two just because edinburgh have lost a lot of their internationals and even when they did have, and they're not having the best of seasons, really. You know, they, they are they are struggling a little bit. You know, and you know, Ospreys are gate once again are gaining more players than any of the other te- teams in URC because they sent selfishly decided to cripple anyone who is actually good. So you know, the pride restorers have to bake up the bulk of the world squad. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think you know with Boothy Ball, you know it should be an easy five points for you know the match. I have broken, is Toby Booth. The, by the <laughs> way, you are rattled. <laughs> Every time oh, you see God. the word pride, you can go into an incandescent <laughs> rage. You know, because well, I have you know Scat from Ice Age, and he gets that little twitch. Yeah, that that that's basically the glasses cover it really well, but that's just my eye can't see whenever you text me pride. Oh God, Jamie, save me, man! Uh, give me, give me your Ospreys prediction. I'm going Ospreys by three. I think they'll win up there. Uh, I know we talk about Cardiff feel good, RFC etc., but the real feel good is at the Ospreys right now. They've won five on the bounce. And I think they'll go up there and win. You know, it just seems to be clicking at the right time. Toby Booth doing a great job. Very winnable game. And I think Ospreys will edge it. So Ospreys by three. Cool. Okay. And uh, I'm going to go Ospreys by five as well. Same reasons as everyone said. It's just too strong. Too many uh, Scotland players not going to be released. Scotland are going to hold them back in just because, you know, they're in with a decent shout uh, now. So, uh, yeah. So uh, Ospreys by five up there. So uh, next game, so that's a Friday night game. And did I say it was on? Yes, on S4C. No, BBC, isn't it? Friday night. BBC and yeah. Fire Play, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, then Connell Scarlet is the five o'clock kickoff on uh, Saturday. Um, so the only real interest in this game is 
what happens with our defence, so change rounds in defence and what have you. Interesting place to go to test our new defence coach. Um, I say new defence coach, but you know what I mean. So, yeah, is something that there's been a lot of, of positives uh, at the Scarlets this year in attack that have just been nullified by a shit defence. Um, and all I'm really, really looking for is can we defend around in close? So James has just worked out how to do that. Do two I do it all the same. Yeah, do two of them, man, and see what see what happens because it's it's quite so interesting. Uh, so um, if you do that as well, it it does uh it does some stuff. So I'm I'm going con up by five anyway. Yeah, it doesn't do it. <laughs> that one it just wants to do that, Jim. Fucking no, that's not doing anything. I up. Right, so uh, Jamie, Scarlet, uh, Scarlet's Connaught. Connaught. Really tough place to go, isn't it? You know, and Scarlet's got a lot of players now with Wales, so I've gone for Connaught by 10. Ooh. Okay, um, we'll leave that one there. Lovely show, please. Thank you, James. Um, John McNichol to have 12 defenders beaten and two line breaks. Uh, oh, sorry, you want uh, score predictions, right? Um, You're just uh, jealous because we've got social media out, but, mate, come on. Score. My reply was so much funnier. Um, uh, Connacht by 70. Connacht in a really by, tough place uh, to go. Osprey found that out early on. And it's meant to be pissing down. Mm. Well, I mean, it, it's pissing down constantly out there anyway. But uh, Harley, go on, justify yours. So, uh, Connacht by 20, because Scarlet's are utter wank. Connacht have lost no one, really, to uh, to oil and call-ups. Bundyaki oh. barely plays, and same for Bielam, and they're going to be really fucking fuming that they only just about scraped past Cardiff. So, does your missus listen to the pod? Because she's going to rip no. you to pieces with that, mate. No, she's too busy <laughs> still thinking about how nice Tommy Lewis has ass looked against Exeter. <laughs> fair enough. Okay, <laughs> got it. <laughs> but we needed someone to replace Halfpenny for uh, bringing in the, the the ladies to the game, so. Uh, right, let's move on. Has she on. seen Reese Henry? Yes, that's funny enough why she's supporting the Scarlet. <laughs> so, um, Cardiff Leinster. So, this is the half seven kickoff on Saturday again on S4C. So, um, so the highlights, so you know, the good positive things here we should be getting a decent student crowd in because we're doing student tickets. So, you know, it'll give them a nice, nice sort of pre drinks before going out and getting pissed and hopefully forgetting about this game. As you know, we get beaten by the Leinster under 12s. <laughs> by how much? I'm going by 12, which is about as optimistic oh. as I possibly can be. I think that's very optimistic, mate. Very optimistic. James, your uh, Leinster or Cardiff v Leinster? Uh, Cardiff by one was a Jared Evans penalty in the last minute. Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> uh, that was two years <laughs> ago, mate. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I am going to go Cardiff by two. The Jerry fuck is at home, and they. Um, but I keep predicting them to win, and they keep losing. Yeah, exactly. I keep predicting them to to win, and they keep losing. So long may it continue. Um, yeah, Cardiff, Cardiff by two. Okay, Jamie. I got a feeling this is going to be a tight game, but they're going to go for Leinster by two. I think they're going to make very hard work of it. Not quite as hard work as like you know on it, but I, I do think it's going to be very, very tight, so I'll go maybe two, three points. Yeah, let's say Cardiff sorry, let's go Leinster by three points then. Leinster by three. Leinster three. Yeah. Leinster by three. Okay, mate. Cool. And that brings us, oh, I haven't done my score, but uh, so uh, my prediction is Leinster by 20. I think your boys are getting fucking tonked. Right, so <laughs> um, let's, let's move on to uh, Dragons and Ulster. So this is also on Saturday, same time, just not televised. Am I right on that, Jay? It's half seven? No, it's on, it's on fire play. Yeah, it's, it's on, on fire play sports. So it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's um, 7.35. Yeah. yeah. It's on free to way, but it's on fire free, play. Yeah. Is it not on so, um, BBC Sport BBC Northern Ireland? Hmm. No. No. I didn't see it on there. I just saw it on fire play. Yeah. Okay. That's um, okay. So Dragons are up shit street big time. Um, they are ravaged by injuries. As things stand, now this could change over the next coming days, but as things stand, Dragons have just two fit back rowers Sean Lonsdale, Dan Lydia. That's all they've got. 
So if I'm Di Flanagan, I'm getting on the phone to Warren Gatland and asking him very nicely, can we have Tane Basham back? Because we're fucked oh, now. You must be desperate. Um, <laughs> well, we are, obviously. There's and I do like Tane, and he does need him. Oh, and Conker, isn't there, from the under-20s who plays for Ebby Vale? Yes, but I don't think he's going to go in straight away. I just think they're looking to bring him in for next season because his coach did say he's not ready for pro rugby at this stage. He needs another year or two. But uh, if things are that desperate, maybe the Dragons will fast track him. But uh, yeah, we we got like two fit back rowers. Um, uh, we had 21 injuries going into the Glasgow game. Uh, we had the likes of Jared Rosser go off. We had George Young go off. We had um, oh, Kai Evans go off as well. Um, yeah, so we're in big, big trouble with injuries. And then when you take everything else into account, low on confidence, passive defence, um, Ulster, to use a football term, it's the new manager bounce. So obviously they haven't got Dan McFarlane now, have they? So um, they're going to target this game because they've got South Africa after our game. So they are going to want five points at home. And I just think it's going to be another hammering for but the Dragons. I'm afraid. They, they haven't got a new manager yet, though, have they? Because Richie Murphy's not coming in until the end of the 26 Nations. They've got the assistant coach, Dan Soper, so he's taking charge. Richie Murphy Wait. will come in after the end of 20s, but they have got Dan Soper as... Uh, well, he'll be leading the team until Richie I'd, Murphy comes in. I'd write Dragons off, but I wouldn't write them off that much. Ulster were fucking woeful on the weekend. Like, actually, genuinely woeful. Like, I, I and did you watch I... the dragons in Glasgow? <laughs> um, <laughs> you want to talk about Woeful? Have you watched the dragons lately? Have you seen yeah, you our defense? This, this is why this there. game isn't on uh, free to air TV, boys. This is, so... is going to be a movable object versus a stoppable force. <laughs> well, the defense is really, really bloody. It, it is a big uh, concern, the defense, because I mean, they can't even do the basics, can they? You, you saw that tap and go. That they yeah. fucked up, so uh, they're in big, big trouble, Dragons. So I've gone first by thirty-three points. Ulster by thirty-three. Oof. Yeah. Okay, James, you're uh, you're slagging off of Ulster because uh, Ospreys beat them last week, and anything that uh, Dragons get is because you softened them up last week. Ulster by thirteen. Ulster by thirteen. That's kind. Yeah, man, they're fucking woeful. I told you, you're just a lot more woeful. But they're playing the dragons. You don't understand, <laughs> do you? You don't yeah. understand. You haven't watched the dragons much. You can't have. Jamie's got his done. mojo back, boys. The one time, <laughs> the one time I watched the fucking dragons, you beat us. J- Jamie's aggressive pessimism is back. It, it, it disappeared for the start of the season, and it's it's back with. Uh... We got no players. <laughs> We're fucking screwed. We got like twenty odd players signing it. injury pro. <laughs> Prone old men from the Scarlet. Admittedly, what he's one of the <laughs> one, one of your few good fit players. <laughs> Lydia is fit actually. So if you talk about yeah, old men, Lydia is fit for this game. Oh. Yeah. Harley, your your prediction. Well, I'm feeling really kind now, seeing uh, hearing Jamie's prediction, seeing what you've put on the sheet. So I've gone for Ulster by 15, purely mm. because Ulster will beat themselves mostly because they somehow managed to fuck up doing a rolling ball, even though that was literally their only attacking platform, only thing they could get to work and attack. Mm. You know, their scrum's probably going to be a lot better against Dragons. So, uh, you know, because I, I, I don't think... I don't, I don't think Rodri Jones on his own is going to be able to hold, hold it up. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, I don't think it's going to be pretty in terms of score all, all the game. So... I think it's going to be an ugly game as well, but I think it'll result in a lot of tries. I think you'll, you'll come away with like bonus points by half time, and everyone will be going, This is just like an insane game where everybody just kind of nobody bothers with defense. Let's put it that way. So, but I'm coming that was with, all season. Yeah, Ulster by 20 is, is my uh, prediction on that one. So, Okie Koki, we are very nearly done, gentlemen. Very nearly done on the happy bits. So I've got one last bit that I just want to cover off before we finish for the evening. So I, I put some stuff out to you guys earlier in the week about doing some charity stuff for Christmas. I think we're at that level now. I think people are looking at us and people are nicking our social media output, they're nicking what we say and all that kind of stuff. There'll be offers coming in for you guys left, right and centre and transfers coming to our pod and all that kind of stuff. So 
I thought we're at that level now where we could maybe do some charity stuff round about Christmas. This is next season, yes. But I just wanted to get a little bit of a feel up from our listeners. So we'll put some social media posts out on what do we do for a charity thing. Nobody's allowed to do anything naked before Carwin suggests that, because I know that's just that's his go-to. That's that's in the back pocket and that's coming out. So nothing naked or nearly naked. Never again. I mean, I'm still recovering from the under 15s tour. So um yeah, but let's let's get some let's get some ideas because we've got some good ideas, but I want to hear what people want to say as well. And so my, my one is uh, you know, do we do an auction and would people be interested? If we can get stuff out of the regions, you know, I don't know, a, a fancy day, a, a you know, tour of the stadium, a, watch a game from a director's box, that sort of thing, you know, do would people pay for that and all that kind of stuff? But let us know because um I do want to do something. I do want to give a little bit back to to some people who uh, uh, probably deserve it more than we do. So that's my my thing. Just putting some feelers out there now, and we'll see where that goes between now and the end of this season. And then that gives us a summer to get it in place, and then we'll we'll do some stuff at the start of next season. Okay. So with that in mind, that is us done for the evening, gents. Been very good boys this evening. That's that's hour and a half. You you done well. You should give yourself a pat on the back. Congratulations. Lee, I have a question very quickly. Oh fuck. I see I said how I much see... how much <laughs> do you scoff when you see the size of uh, the Osprey Time uh, podcast file every week? Because routinely I think the last two weeks we've been I think we were an hour and forty five last week and two hours the week before. Do you oh. just hate us? No, I just don't listen, mate. I just, I, I just, I just, I do the first bit and then I do the last bit and then I go, yeah, okay. <laughs> I just, uh, I feel sorry for your boys. I feel sorry for Martin because he, he loves you boys and Martin will do absolutely anything that you boys ask him to. And you go, mind you, he's a long distance lorry driver and he's, he's got like six hours in between stops. So he probably listens to you three times. What a disgrace of a podcast we have. <laughs> I can't believe you force us to finish recording early. I know. So let yeah. those boys go. Fucking hell, man. Anyway, gents, thank you for your time this evening. I hope you all enjoy your rugby this weekend. So, oh, just to keep Jamie happy. Jamie loves this bit. So we're available on. Where are we available on, Jane? Do do that bit for me, man. Where where can we get hold of the podcast? We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Spotify. We're on YouTube. We're on the Sports Social Network. We're on Castbox. We're on Pocket Casts and all the other good platforms that you know of. There you go. See, that's that's why Jamie should be doing it. All right, I shall see you next week, gents. All the very best. Have a good one. Enjoy your rugby. Have a good one. Ta da. That's that. listening to the rap podcast we hope you enjoyed listening as much as we enjoyed recording it please do rate us and tell your friends as it really helps us to grow and get better we'll be back next week with more of the same and until then enjoy your rugby sports social podcast network judy was boring hello then judy discovered chumbacasino.com it's my little escape Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.